this film is about a frontier. You won't find it marked as a red line on a map, yet it's 5,000 kilometers long and runs around the edge of Britain. It's the coastline. This frontier that looks so permanent is in fact constantly changing in detail. The coastline is a battleground between land, sea and human activity. We often get the wrong impression of the coast as an environment, probably because we normally go to it on holiday when it's nice and warm and sunny and relaxing. But the truth is often more like today. It's two degrees Celsius, got a force six wind coming from the southwest, and masses of wave energy directed at the frontier between land and sea. The power of the waves depends largely on the distance they have to travel, and that distance is called the fetch. And there's nothing between this stretch of the south coast and Brazil, 10,000 kilometers way out there. So, what with the huge fetch from the southwest and the powerful southwesterly winds, today these two forces are working together to hit the coast really hard. I think I'd rather be on the beach of Brazil, wouldn't you? The enormous amount of open water between America and the British Isles enables the waves to gain great power during their long fetch from the southwest. What's more, the most common wind is from the same direction adding even greater power to the waves. One of the places that gets the full force of all of this is where this programme was made, the coast of southern England, in Dorset and Hampshire. Thanks mostly to the high wave energy, this stretch of coast has some of the grandest scenery in the country. And the shapes of the landforms are thanks to a lucky mixture of rocks some hard, some soft. And it couldn't be clearer. Hard rock, just a few metres away from soft rock. The harder rock is on the outside, facing the sea. It's called Portland stone. This works like armour, protecting the softer rocks behind from the waves. But the sea is a very powerful force and always finds a way through. It seeks out weaknesses in the outer wall and drives holes through. Once it's punched through the Portland stone, the water eats away at the softer rock behind, creating coves and inlets. This erosion that's happened in the softer rock behind the hard outside wall is something that's going on all along this piece of coast. In one spot, the sea has taken the process much farther and created one of South England's great beauty spots, Lulworth Cove. We can speed things up to show how the cove was formed. First, we need to whiz the clock back a few thousand years. Right, so hard rock on the outer wall, soft next behind it, then hard again behind that. Then, the start of the process is the sea punching a hole through a weakness in the outer wall. Once into the soft rock, the sea starts to erode sideways, and things speed up considerably, until it reaches a barrier, the second wall of hard rock. Result, the shape of Lulworth Cove today. Recently, geologists have been able to apply this process at Lulworth, to other parts of the south coast. They now have a much clearer picture of how large stretches of coast have evolved over thousands of years. David Harlan, Bournemouth Borough Council. Has the coastline always been this shape? No, not at all. This is the coastline we recognise today from Old Harry Rocks all the way around Pool Bay to Hengisbury Head, around Christchurch Bay to Hurst Spit and to the Needles. But 9,000 years ago there would have been a continuous chalk bridge from the Needles to Old Harry Rocks. By about 6000 BC, there must have been a large erosion bay forming, a much larger version of the Lulworth Cove that you can see now. Probably by 2000 BC, there was a very much bigger bay, and by Roman times, the coast was beginning to look as it does now with two distinct bays. 
Much of the time, changes to the coastline, like those described by David Harlow, happen so gradually that the process is hardly noticeable. You could sit around for months without spotting a single change. But it can be extremely quick. The crew of the Eastbourne lifeboat saw something huge happen with their own eyes on this stretch of coast of Beachy Head. The coxswain of the lifeboat is David Cork. Could you tell us what happened here, David? Well, we were on our Sunday morning exercise coming round Beachy Head, and we saw the, the contour of the shoreline have changed considerably by this massive rock fall. 100,000 tonnes of white chalk had fallen from the cliff into the sea joining the lighthouse to the mainland. So you're not going to take us in to have a look then? Absolutely not. This is as close as you're going to get. The cliff face is very, very unstable at this present time. It'd be far too dangerous for anybody to get on the shoreline. The closest anybody can get to the rockfall is up here, about 150 metres above it. And absolutely typical of the coastal frontier is that it was really two forces which caused the fall. Firstly, high wave energy smashing at the cliffs during a storm. And secondly, two weeks of heavy rainfall working its way into the chalk and loosening and weakening the rock. The result, a mass of material fell away from the cliff face below me. So, even during the short period of time we've been making this programme, the frontier between land and sea has moved. And to be honest, nobody knows when it'll move again. So. I'm off. The 100,000 tonnes of rock that fell off Beachy Head are only a fraction of the millions of tonnes of coastline that are eroded every year. But where does all this material go? What on earth does the sea do with it? On a chunk of coastline like this, with such huge features, it's easy to forget the little things, which are just as important. And here they are. Rivers carry material with them, so do glaciers, and so does the sea. And the sea's material is called beach sediment. A lot of this will have been brought along the coast from the southwest, which is the main direction of wave attack. It's either been removed from the cliffs by erosion or brought down to the shore by rivers. Some of this might actually have come quite a long way. Like, for instance, this ready brown stuff looks like a sandstone from the Devon coast, 50 kilometers back there. What's happening to the beach sediment at the water's edge looks a bit haphazard. But in fact, there's a very regular movement going on here. How the beach sediment moves, you can see by concentrating on one single pebble. A wave rolls up the beach diagonally from the southwest and takes the pebble with it. The southwest being the direction of the fetch and wave attack. The pebble falls back as the wave slips away. This happens again, and again, and again. This movement is called longshore drift. There's an updrift direction and a downdrift direction, just as there's an upstream and downstream for a river. In places where there's a bend in the coastline, the sediment moving along the coast keeps on going in the downdrift direction. The beach grows out from the shore forming a feature known as a spit. Like her spit in Hampshire. The spit is so symmetrical, it looks artificial, in a way, like a road. But of course, it's natural, and it's been here for thousands of years. And it's quite likely that a fair amount of this came all the way from where we started the programme, more than 50 kilometres away at Lulworth Cove, beach setting. So far in the programme, we've been looking at coastal processes, assuming that they're taking place in an entirely natural setting. But the truth is, we need one more crucial factor to complete the picture. Human intervention. And nowhere is the human factor so blatant as in the area around Bournemouth. 150 years ago, as the country's railway network spread out from the major cities, Bournemouth was one of the scores of towns that sprang up on the coast, adding the human touch to the natural coastline. Bournemouth is still a major resort today. But it's not just buckets and spades anymore. 
The look of the beach is important to the town's modern image as an international centre of business, learning and leisure. This growth in modern business has made the beach an even more valuable asset. The stakes have been raised. David Harlow again. Could you tell me how important the beach is to Bournemouth? These five miles of golden sands are very important to Bournemouth. In the early days it brought the fashion for sea bathing, the fashion for sea bathing brought the paddle steamers, the piers were built, now we have a party political conferences here, we have thousands of visitors, all sorts of facilities, but in the end what people really want to see is the beach. But Bournemouth has always had a problem holding on to its sand, because Longshore Drift has the unfortunate habit of taking it away in vast quantities. To stop longshore drift washing away their beach material, Bournemouth started building groins, wooden barriers. The way a groin works is incredibly simple. It traps beach sediment on its way along the coast on the updrift side. You end up with a strange shaped beach, but it's better than no beach at all. To wrestle with nature is an expensive business. A single groin costs around £200,000. But the alternative would be to let the beach disappear and allow Bournemouth's economy to crash. An unthinkable option. A fortune has been spent on protecting the beaches, but in the long term, the sea always wins. So in the end, by the 1960s, beach levels were extremely low in Bournemouth and we had to consider beach replenishment. That involved pumping about a, one and a half million cubic metres of sand and gravel onto the beaches and that immediately restored the beaches to their former levels and acted as a very much better coast protection. To secure the sand, both natural and artificial, there are now a hundred groins along the 13 kilometre stretch of the coast around Bournemouth. And no prizes for what comes next? You can't meddle with nature on this scale without a knock-on effect. And there's a clue to what that is right here. Below is the last of the groins to the east, downdrift of Bournemouth. Over the years, it has held back a huge amount of beach sediment that longshore drift would have carried farther along the coast to keep beaches going in the next bay. The beaches beyond the groin have thus been starved of material. And look how narrow they are. Let's now go a little bit farther down this part of the coast. It's not that pretty a sight. Welcome to Barton-on-Sea. They claim this is a seaside resort, but it looks more like a film set for a battlefield. What a mess. Barton's in a real predicament. Starved of material by the groins in Bournemouth, the town's beach is down to a fraction of its original width. In fact, at high tide, there's no beach at all. Wave energy acts directly on the cliffs. You may think I'm walking on the clifftop, but no, I'm walking along what used to be the clifftop before it fell down from up there. Barton's other piece of hard luck is that it's got the wrong rocks in its cliffs. To understand what's happening, we need to take a cross section through the cliff face. On top is a layer of sandy gravel. Beneath is a layer of clay. The real trouble starts when there's heavy rain. The sandy gravel is permeable, so the water seeps through it. The clay, though, is impermeable and holds water from the sand above and the rain falling directly on it. Soon, the clay turns into a soggy, slippery mass. Then, helped by the waves pounding the foot of the cliff, it happens. This unfortunate phenomenon is called rotational cliff slumping. It's amazing what you can find on a beach that's had rotational cliff slumping. This is a piece of someone's drain. This looks like a bit of their wall. And up there, a piece of their chimney pot. Like the rockfall at Beachy Head, the slumping at Barton is one of those coastal processes 
that has happened extremely quickly. As water gushes from the clay, and as the clay oozes out of the cliff face, the shape of the coast can change from one day to the next. The land-sea frontier here is so alive, you have to watch your step every bit of the way. Slumped coastlines are so unstable and dangerous that trying to control them is a really serious business. Any kind of coastal protection requires huge and expensive engineering works. How much to spend and where to spend it often depends on a very simple formula. If the clifftop property is expensive, spend the money. If it's cheap, don't. This is more or less what happened at Barton. Andrew Bradbury, New Forest Borough Council. Over to the west, we've got a fairly heavily defended stretch of coastline, um, which has got groins and revetments and cliff drainage works, which has arrested the erosion, protecting the high value properties. But over to the east here, we've got the soft cliffs, where it would be difficult to introduce an effective uh, coast protection work. And also, we've also got relatively low value property in, in the form of holiday chalets on the top of the cliffs and the management strategy adopted there is to simply uh, pick them up and move them backwards when they get within a, an unsafe distance of the cliff top. There is a point of view that says that coastal protection is a complete waste of time, that the sea will always win and that natural forces should be allowed to take their own course. But that view doesn't go down very well in an area like Hampshire, with a huge economy and high property values. The debate about whether to protect the coast or let things go doesn't really get off the ground here. So what would happen if all this coastal defence work stopped? Well, obviously, the waves are going to carry on moving the sediment with the longshore drift immediately. Within five to ten years, we'll lose virtually all of the sand on the beach. At that point, the groins will start to collapse, and that will expose the seawall to serious wave attack. Given another five years or so, most of the promenade would go, and the cliffs would start eroding. At that point, we're going to start losing another metre per year. So within 200 years, you'll lose a swathe of form of 200 metres deep. As you move towards Hengistbury Head, probably within 50 years, we'd have a breach through into Christchurch Harbour, which will isolate the head itself into an island. About 50 years after that, you'll have a, a single bay formed with the head completely gone, just one bay. This is Highcliffe, a seaside town right in the middle of the Bournemouth Christchurch conurbation, and we're about halfway along the stretch of coast we'll be looking at in this programme. At the moment, the sea's about 500 metres over there, and there's a lot of debate about whether to protect the coastline. But if we don't, all of this could fall into the sea. If that happens, it won't be a question of two, because this spot will be right in it. <laughs> 